probably all of us are at least passingly familiar with the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, though I doubt that many of you have actually read it before. Instead, our knowledge of this work comes through its presence in popular culture. When I first told my wife I was teaching this work, for example, she asked me if it was anything like the Sylvester and Tweety version, referring to a Looney Tunes cartoon from 1960 named Hide and Go Tweet, in which Tweety gets hold of Dr. Jekyll's potion and turns into a giant Tweety monster. <laughs> Even if you've never seen this or any other film adaptation of Stevenson's novella, you're still probably familiar with the concept of Jekyll and Hyde, a term that's become so widespread that it's really part of our basic vocabulary now. Unfortunately, this familiarity may actually put us at a disadvantage when trying to read and think about this important work of literature. Often, when literature starts to trickle into popular culture, it transforms somewhat, sometimes becoming almost unrecognizable in the process. Uh, Mary Shelley's 1818 novel Frankenstein is probably the best example of this phenomenon. If you ever read this book, you know that most film and television versions of the story have very little to do with Mary Shelley's novel, so much so that most people now think that Frankenstein is the name of a big green monster with bolts on his neck, when the name Frankenstein actually refers to the scientist who creates the creature. Treatments of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde have been a little more faithful than those of Frankenstein, but even when they get the plot and characters right, these treatments almost always misunderstand and misrepresent the ideas in Stevenson's work. So when we approach Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the first thing we need to do is to clear our minds of all the cultural baggage which comes along with the story. Try to read about these characters as if you've never heard of them before. Instead of thinking about it as a classic horror tale, try to approach the story in the context of the Victorian period, because I think that's what the novella is really about. But now I'm jumping ahead of myself. The fact is, although some early critics of the work viewed it as little more than a sensationalistic horror story, readers in the last 120 years have found several different important themes in this novella. Perhaps the most common interpretation of the book focuses on the fight between good and evil. Certainly the dualistic nature of the Jekyll and Hyde character relies on the difference of good and evil. Dr. Jekyll is a character of high social standing and regard, and he's described by Enfield, who's Utterson's cousin, as a man who does, quote, what they call good. In other words, he's a philanthropist of some kind. Now, whether Enfield is remarking on Jekyll's character or simply on his profession as a doctor, which I think is unlikely, since Jekyll's not really a practicing doctor, well, but it's unclear. We do know that Jekyll is regarded by most of his acquaintances as a good man. Hyde, on the other hand, is unmistakably evil. The first thing we hear about him is his willingness to trample young children as if they're little more than obstacles, and his portrait gets only worse after that. And it's not just Hyde's actions that mark him as evil. His appearance is so forbidding that most people can't bring themselves to look directly at him, and those who do often experience blood-chilling effects. I think there are some problems, however, with interpreting Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as simply a comment on the battle between good and evil. The most serious of the problems is identifying what kind of comment the story is making. By the end of the book, Mr. Hyde has essentially overpowered Dr. Jekyll, and the only way Jekyll can get rid of him is by killing himself, or so we assume. Is Stevenson saying that evil is more powerful than good? Is he implying that the only way good can conquer evil is by sacrificing itself? This line of reasoning gets sticky, to say the least. Furthermore, many readers balk at treating Dr. Jekyll as a personification of goodness. Though Jekyll himself claims that his worst fault, quote, was a certain impatient gaiety of disposition, many readers regard the doctor's pride, or his deceit, or even his drug use, if that's how we want to characterize the mixture that he drinks, as serious flaws that mark him as less than completely good. And it may even be difficult to treat Hyde as the embodiment of evil, despite his terrifying appearance and his callous actions. The first description we get of Mr. Hyde is interesting in this way. Enfield remembers Hyde running over the little girl on the street in the following way. Quote, the man trampled calmly over the child's body and left her screaming on the ground. It sounds nothing to hear, but it was hellish to see. It wasn't like a man. It was like some damn juggernaut. While Hyde's actions here are naturally disgusting to readers, they don't seem to be motivated by evil. 
Hyde didn't set out to trample the little girl. He simply didn't stop walking when he came to where she was standing. He doesn't take delight in causing pain to the little girl. He just fails to display the appropriate sympathy for her. I mean, he's not a nice guy, but it may be a stretch to equate him with Satan. But the biggest problem I see with the standard good versus evil reading of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is that it's much too limited. This kind of reading looks only at the two title characters, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, for its meaning. But while the plot definitely focuses on the transformation of Jekyll into Hyde, throughout most of the story, neither of these characters plays a very large role. We hear about them, but we don't hear from them very much, at least not until the last chapter. Instead, most of the story seems to be about other characters, like Utterson's or Enfield's or Dr. Lanyon's or even Poole's perceptions of Jekyll and Hyde. If the point of the story is simply the battle between the good and the evil that Jekyll and Hyde represent, why do we spend so much of our time listening to other characters? I think the answer to the question lies in in the novella's attitude towards society, specifically late Victorian society. So far, we've been discussing Victorian England in mostly positive terms. We've focused on the social concerns of many Victorian writers. We've discussed the emphasis on reform in uh, laws and in society during the time. But there was definitely a dark side to Victorian earnestness as well, seen in the strict Victorian attitude towards personal morality. This attitude was probably an inevitable offshoot of the drive towards seriousness and purpose that we so often identify with the Victorian period, but it manifested itself as what's sometimes called priggery. Now, a prig is not just a moral person, but maybe a self-consciously moral person, and a person who uses their concern for morality as a way to feel superior to other people. And maybe it makes them sort of holier than that, we may say. And it's this approach to morality that I think more or less defines the way the early 20th century saw the Victorian period. To writers in the early 20th century, the Victorians were what we might call today anal retentive. They seemed to be entirely caught up in rules of propriety and behavior that to the 20th century seemed very uptight and old-fashioned. We'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to the early 20th century, and specifically when we get to modernism, which is a literary movement that sort of defined itself in reaction against this kind of, or this definition, I guess, of Victorianism. But back to our text, how can we read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as a critique of Victorian morality or Victorian approaches to morality? Maybe the easiest place to start is by looking at Jekyll's own description of his development in the last chapter of the book. When he tells of his early life, Jekyll explains that he, quote, concealed his pleasures, which he also refers to as, quote, irregularities, unquote. Now, what does he mean here? It's not entirely clear, but it sounds like Dr. Jekyll is confessing that he engaged in various activities that would have been considered either inappropriate or fully immoral in his time period. Many critics have assumed that Jekyll's referring to deviant sexual activities, and by deviant I mean as defined by the Victorian period. You know, maybe that he was homosexual, or like Stevenson, we know, did in his youth, maybe he frequented brothels. Victorian morality was particularly harsh towards these kinds of activities, so it seems likely that that's the kind of thing that Jekyll might be referring to. But whatever these irregularities consisted of, it seems clear that Jekyll's later experimentation, which resulted in the creation of his alternate personality, Mr. Hyde, was pursued in part to offer him an outlet for interests or behaviors that a society wouldn't have approved of. In this context, Mr. Hyde is little more than a disguise, a persona that allows Jekyll the free exercise of his irregular urges, as he would call them. Jekyll finds that his personality is somewhat split. On the one hand, he is a respectable member of society, but on the other, he pursues pleasures that his society finds immoral. But of course, Dr. Jekyll isn't unique in this regard. Um, Many people find themselves morally divided. They find they have urges, whether sexual or chemical or material, that are at least somewhat at odds with what their society officially expects of them. So maybe we all have a little Mr. Hyde in us, I guess. It's also helpful to look closely at the way other characters in the novel react to Mr. Hyde. Enfield is the first character to describe the revulsion that people feel toward Hyde, even when they're unaware of his actions. Enfield says that his first full glance at Mr. Hyde, quote, brought out the sweat on him like running, unquote. 
Virtually every character who interacts at all with Mr. Hyde reports a similar feeling. What's so terrible about the appearance of Mr. Hyde? I mean, certainly he's described in the novel as deformed, but these reactions seem to point towards something more powerful than just the side of physical deformity. I mean, I would hope that a character like Mr. Enfield, for example, wouldn't be completely disgusted by someone just because they had a physical deformity. And Utterson tells us when he first sees Hyde that there's something more going on. In fact, he specifically says there must be something more to his reaction. What is this something more? We might get a hint near the end of the second chapter. Utterson wonders if Jekyll's situation might be the result of, quote, the ghost of some old sin, the cancer of some concealed disgrace, punishment coming for actions Jekyll indulged in when he was a younger man. Utterson also tells us that Jekyll was wild as a youth, which seems relevant here. This thought sparks Utterson to examine his own life, to see if some jack-in-the-box of an old iniquity should leap to light there. In other words, the sight of Mr. Hyde has led Utterson to consider the possibility that his own character might contain some bit of the evil that Mr. Hyde represents. And maybe this is why people react so disgustedly to the sight of Hyde. He's an unwelcome reminder of that small piece of evil, in other words, the immorality, at least as society defines it, that lurks inside each of us. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're supposed to view Hyde sympathetically. I mean, he's definitely a bad guy. But Stevenson may be pointing out that Mr. Hyde is what happens when people are encouraged by their society to deny their own true urges. In other words, Dr. Jekyll might be suffering from what psychologists sometimes call repression. He has repressed certain parts of his personality because he feels that these parts are unacceptable to his society. You might notice that there are two doors to Dr. Jekyll's house. Jekyll and his social acquaintances enter through the front door, while Hyde always comes in the back entrance. These two doors, in other words, might be a metaphor for the difference between Jekyll and Hyde, specifically the difference that one of them is sort of socially acceptable, the face you put on for society, the front door person, and Hyde is the part that you kind of keep uh, to yourself away from society, the back door version of yourself. These same psychologists could tell you what often happens when something is repressed in this way. At some point, it pushes back against that repression and emerges violently. Repression is a universal tendency, but it's probably more common in society with very strict moral codes, like, say, Victorian England. If we accept this interpretation of the story, I think we have to view Stevenson as more than just a horror writer. In his criticism of Victorian morality, Stevenson's really a forerunner of many modern, by which I mean early 20th century, attitudes. And more specifically, he's a forerunner of one of the great figures of the late 19th and early 20th century, Sigmund Freud. Freud, who we'll talk more about later, is most famous for his theory that all minds contain various forces that operate against each other. Freud says that we all experience urges that society deems inappropriate to act on. He calls this the id. But Freud also says that we contain a regulating force, what he calls the superego, that keeps us in line. Psychological problems occur, according to Freud, when these forces aren't in balance. Certainly we see this battle in the struggles of Dr. Jekyll to regulate his dark side. And just as certainly, even if you reject this specific interpretation of the story, it's difficult to dismiss this book and Robert Louis Stevenson as just another example of sensationalistic entertainment. It's pretty clear there's more going on in the story than just Sylvester and Tweety would have us believe. Hey everybody, I have a bonus opportunity for you, but this one's going to take a little bit of research. Here's the story. When I was a kid, one of the first books I ever owned was written by the same author as The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But here's the thing, I don't remember the name of the book. Here's what I do remember. It was a book of poetry, mostly for children. It had a red cover, at least the one that I owned had a red cover. And in it, there were a lot of poems. My favorite one was a poem called My Shadow. So here's what I'll do. I'll give two bonus points towards your discussion grade to any student, not just the first student, but any student who either emails me or messages me through Canvas with the name of the book. I'll also give an extra point, so three points, if you 
um, give me kind of a summary of the My Shadow poem to kind of jog my memory. If it's good enough, anyway, I'll give you the extra point. So, get looking. If you have any questions, let me know.